In a culture of self-assertion, we will become more and more incapable of forgiveness. And Christians will more and more be a counterculture in which forgiveness is still possible. And I think, I think Christians, therefore, can be salt and light in this country if we're still able to forgive, but not if we start to use all the same belligerent sort of language that everybody else is using. Welcome to the Focus on the Family broadcast, helping families thrive. In his book about forgiveness, Dr. Tim Keller writes, we have a profound need to grant and receive forgiveness. Forgiveness gets down to the bottom of things, to the alienation we feel from God and from ourselves because of our wrongdoing. The deepest need of our nature is for Jesus, and the doorway is to know forgiveness. Dr. Keller is back with us today on Focus on the Family as we continue a conversation on this topic. Thanks for joining us. Your host is Focus President and author Jim Daly, and I'm John Fuller. John, we had a really good visit with Tim Keller about this critical matter of forgiveness. We all need to know how to forgive others because as Christians, we've been forgiven so much. But that doesn't mean it's easy to let go of bad feelings we may have about someone else. It's in our sinful nature to harbor resentment or to uh, want to retaliate. Today, uh, Dr. Tim Keller will bring more powerful stories and very practical help for us in forgiving others. So stay with us. Dr. Tim Keller is an author and the founding pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in Manhattan, and he now works with an organization he co-founded called Redeemer City to City. His new book is called Forgive, Why Should I and How Can I? And I hope you'll contact us for your copy when you call 800 the letter A in the word family, or just check the program notes. Now, we spoke with Dr. Keller outdoors near his home in New York City, and we'll pick up the conversation with a couple of great examples of forgiveness. Here now, Jim Daly with Dr. Tim Keller on Focus on the Family. You had another really impactful story. Right here in New York, we're hearing some of the ambient sounds of Are sirens. You? and What? You know, this is an active city, isn't it, John? <laughs> Very active. Yeah, I know. I'm kidding. But you had a story of a New York gang member, young man, yeah, yeah. who uh, demonstrated incredible forgiveness. And describe that story. And where where does a what I would decide or believe would be his unbelieving heart? But you, he can demonstrate some powerful godly truths, even if he doesn't have a faith in Christ. Well, you know, there's actually two stories. One in there was a, uh, a, uh, a policeman who was trying to break something up and was uh, injured by a kid, you know, a, a, an inner city youth, and he was paralyzed the rest of his life. And um, it's interesting, he tried to talk to the kid in prison. He tried to write him in prison and the guy wouldn't talk to him. And then, weirdly enough, he got out and then died in a car accident, in a motorcycle yeah. accident. Huh. And then there was another one where the boy was, um, uh, he wasn't hurt by the, he wasn't the police, he was hurt by other gang members. And he um, was also paralyzed and he, he also forgave. And in both cases, the boy forgave the people who had, had, um, uh, basically paralyzed him and the, the the policeman had forgiven the boy the 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 youth who had uh uh harmed him in fact interesting the policeman looking back said i i now actually realize that it did look pretty racist for me just to show up at these poor kids places of uh where they were huh. playing and where they were living and he he wasn't just convicted that he needed to become a Christian and forgive, but even that he actually had been a person who was sort of guilty of injustice. Yeah. So it's, it's all those, uh, it's never just I've forgiven. Yeah. But usually there's a, a humbling that happens and a new, a new way of understanding themselves. Yeah. So forgiveness is really transformational. It doesn't just reconcile you to other people. It actually gives you a completely different approach. Well, and I, I think the purpose in me asking about those stories is really to set this question up, and that is how, how do you know when you have not or you have uh, truly forgiven somebody? It, there can be a bit of fuzziness about oh, yeah. that. I'll give you a quick example. For me, when I speak about my childhood and my dad, the alcoholic, and they divorced my mom and dad, and 
men who are 60 and 70 years old will be in this line and they'll come up to me in tears saying, I've never been able to forgive my father. Yeah. And I, it's a hard one for me that, what do you say? I mean, you have to let it go. You have to not hold that against them. You've got to forgive them. But there is a lot of that, Tim, in the yeah. Christian culture, just these grievances that we really haven't dealt with. So how do we know, A, that they exist, and then B, if we've actually it's, forgiven? Right. I don't think there's a bright line. Here's what I'll do. Shorthand, here's my pastoral advice to somebody. I will say, and it's in the book, forgiveness is granted before it's felt. See, m- most people say, I, I'm still mad, uh-huh. so I haven't forgiven. So I say, okay, for a moment, why don't we uh, separate the two? Is it, is it, because some people would say, since I'm still mad, I can't forgive. And I say, no, forgiveness is something you can grant before you actually feel it. And that's hmm. very important. And I say, well, what does it mean to grant? Okay, forgiveness is a, is a, a kind of commit, it's a commitment. Um, in principle, the commitment is, I am not going to take revenge on this person. I am not going to make this person pay, okay? In other words, that's, how, that's, that's the definition of any forgiveness. I mean, in the book, I try to say, if uh, somebody knocks your lamp over, it's $50, and they say, oh, I'm so sorry, you can either say, yes, so that'll be $50, please, or you can say, forget it, which means you forgive them, but then you have to go out and buy the lamp. The $50 doesn't go away. Right. Or, or maybe you go in darkness, but the point is, somebody pays, and when forgiveness is always, always deciding I'm not going to make the other person pay. I'm going to absorb it. But to really grant forgiveness day in and day out is to make a commitment to do three things. Not to keep bringing the matter up to the person. Not to keep bringing the matter up to other people to try to kind of run them down, you know, get back at them by hurting their reputation. And not to keep bringing it up over and over again to yourself. So what that means is I, if I find myself thinking about it too much, I say, no, I'm not going to do that. It's a commitment to yourself. Uh, if I find myself kind of having an opportunity to run the person down to somebody else, I'm not going to do that. And if I have an opportunity to use this against, this especially happens, by the way, in marriage. I, <laughs> boy, I, know, I was thinking that. I know you're going to think about that. In other words, some, you say, if, you're, if your spouse says, please forgive me, honey, for that, and you say yes, then you can't bring it up again f- six months later. You must not bring it up six months later. And here's the thing. If you actually make, follow through on those commitments, you'll feel the anger diminishing over time. Mm. If you don't make those three commitments, the anger, I think, stays a very, very long time. So it's granted before it's felt. It's, the granting is basically, I'm not going to take revenge, but in actual day in and day out, it means just refusing to go in those directions. Yeah. And I don't think... The forgiveness is hard. It, it's harder the less God is real to you, and it's easier the more he's real to you. Boy, Sorry. that is a good statement right there. Yeah. That's powerful. And I think that, that also, um, in interviewing a lot of women on the theme of marriage and parenting, the one thing that I've noticed, and you know this, John, they have an incredible capacity to look at themselves first. I think we as men, we kind of have the ego that says, that's the other guy's fault. But yeah. in that context, the question of how to forgive yourself. Um, I'm not the good mom. I'm not the perfect wife. I'm not a good husband. Where does that forgiveness for self come yeah, in? Yeah, where does that come? If somebody's asking me that, I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to work with them. I'm not sure that I think it's the best way of talking about it. Huh. Uh, now, if you're R.C. Sproul, what R.C. used to do is used to say, if somebody said, I have, uh, I know God's forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. And he says, so you have higher standards than God, huh? <laughs> it's a little, which I thought was a little bit, I don't know. I'm not sure that's the best bedside manner. Somebody's really struggling, but he's right. No, at the core, it, what you're saying it, is you're... You're really saying, I have higher standards than God. I mean, people, well, wait a minute. No, I can't. I don't have my... So what it, what, here's what's going on, I think. Generally speaking, there's, a, there's another God going on here. God's forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. Okay, if your real God is your career, and you did something really stupid, and you're probably never going to get your career back on track, and your self-image is not so much based on, 
I'm a child of God. It's based on I'm a successful. I'm an achiever. Whatever, right. Yeah. And now I haven't achieved and I can't forgive myself. What you've really got here is an idol. And see, false gods can't forgive. Hmm. See, what I always like to say to people is, the reason why it'd be better to, say, to serve Jesus rather than your, your career or anything else is Jesus, if you screw up, well, first of all, <laughs> if you get him, he actually satisfies you. You, you know, the C.S. Lewis thing is you get to the top of your career or you become as beautiful as you want to be or you get everything you want. It's never it's, enough. It's never enough. Jesus is the only God that if you get him will satisfy you. And if you fail him, will forgive you. Your career will never forgive you for your sins. Mm. Your career will punish you the rest of your life if that's your God. And so I, it takes me a while with people. I can't just jump in and say, oh, you must be, there must be some idolatry here. You know, I mean, in other words, I would yeah. never go in that way fast. Uh, and you might even, actually, if you know the person well and they're not in too much trouble you might do the the rc it's almost like a joke saying so you have higher standards than god if you know and no i guess not i mean sometimes that actually helps yeah but in most cases it's usually something that they've given their heart way too much to yeah and it is punishing them because it they failed that false god and that's that's where a lot of that that is from. it's really insightful i mean it's a test for idolatry i mean that is really powerful yes actually any inordinate emotion that you can't get rid of. So uh, inordinate bitterness actually can be, towards somebody else, can mean um, that this is an idol. Inordinate fear, I'm going to lose it. Inordinate guilt, that oh, I failed. And you just, inordinate meaning it just doesn't seem to be resolvable. Right. Very often there's some, there's some kind of idolatry. That's something. Let me, let me go back for a moment where you have that conflict with another person and your forgiveness is dependent upon that person's response. Is, ah. Can that be okay, or is that unhealthy? If Back to the groveling, but there may be some more subtle things like that, that right. it, it, it's only going to work if you demonstrate a certain action. Yeah. Then I'll forgive you. Yeah, I'm really glad you got there. There's, there's two verses that look like they're contradictions. Mark 11:25 says, Jesus says, if you're standing and praying and you realize you've got anything against anyone, forgive them. And it doesn't seem to have any conditions, just you have to forgive them. Luke 17 is where it says, if a person repents, you should forgive them. Even if they do it over and over, you forgive them. And so it looks like one is saying you don't have to forgive till they repent. The other one looks like it says you have to forgive whether they repent or not. And my, my, Dear departed friend David Pallison, I don't know if you knew who he was, but yeah. he is a counselor who died recently. Actually, I think he died of pancreatic cancer. Oh, but my. anyway, he said there's an internal forgiveness that you do before immediately. That's Mark eleven twenty five, where you make those commitments we were talking about before, not to keep bringing it up to yourself and others, where you say I'm not going to pay back, and you forgive. But then you do need to go. Be, uh, for the person's sake, for God's sake, for others' sake, and say, you did something here that you really, I don't think you should have done. Now, if you go to them, having forgiven, they still may get their back up and just not want to talk to you. Uh, if you go to them kind of unforgiving and kind of vengeful, saying, do you know what you did to me? They, they will definitely get their back up and not listen to you. But if you go to them forgiven, forgiving and gracious and all that, they might actually start to say, oh, I didn't realize that. I'm so sorry. And they change and you reconcile. Great. But Romans 12, 18 says, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with all. And what that means is you take whatever you get. If mm. the person does not respond well or doesn't want to talk about it or even responds very poorly, you know, in a way that's really kind of half, half wrong, you know, it, I think what you say is, I got it, whatever I can get, and now I'm still going to I'm going to be forgiving, and I'm going to try to be as open to the person as I possibly can. In that respect, I'm thinking of circumstances I've been involved in where you're extending an olive branch, and it gets bitten off, you know. So you do it again, and maybe a third time. 
is there a time that you can say, okay, I gave it my best shot and it's just not happening and you stop extending the olive branch? I think it, that's a judgment call. As long as you say that the, the door is, you know, still open. But it may have to come from the other direction. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's right. In other words, I, I think, I don't know how often. Right. Um, you know, the, first, the Matthew 18 thing where you go to the person and if they don't listen to you, you take somebody and if they don't listen to you, tell it to the church. Most people do not really meet, think that Jesus is saying you get, you get three tries. Right. You know, they, they, it certainly looks like a process. And surely in different situations you would take longer and do it more often. Or, But it is true that you don't want, it's never loving to make it easy for someone to sin against you. Huh. It's not loving to that person. And I have seen some people, you know, say, I'm just trying to put out the olive branch, but basically they're just getting clobbered right. every single time. And I said, I don't think it makes, it's not helping the perpetrator by making it so easy for the perpetrator to despise you and yell at you. And I don't know that that's, that's a good a, yeah, idea. Yeah, it's an interesting perspective. You're emboldening them to continue yeah, the behavior that them. hurts other people. Let me ask you this. One of the hardest things for people to do is to confront someone lovingly. And I think, again, yeah. is there a difference between a, confronting a non-believer and mm-hmm. someone within the community of Christ? And, uh, you know, the scenario makes all the difference. And I, I, I'm just thinking about, do you go about it differently? Because on the one hand, I can remember a Christian leader saying to me, who's going to hold them accountable to God's righteousness And that would be the response to loving your neighbor, you know, without perhaps without any boundaries. So how do you how do you engage, I guess, that accountability between the world and the church, the fellow believer? Certainly, I do think that if you have another professing believer who you think has wronged you, I think the Matthew 18 stuff is that uh, you you are both accountable to God. You're both accountable to the scripture you might be in the same church, maybe not, but I do think you the re, the reconciliation uh, attempt can go on longer. You know, you, you have more resources. You probably should should not give up on it. Your brother and sister or brothers or sisters in Christ. Uh, I do think somebody outside uh, there's a limit to what you can appeal to when you're talking to them. You know, I mean, with with a Christian, you've got all that. You've got the Word of God, and you've got so many other you've got better arguments for why you shouldn't have done that. Right. Um, and so I guess I would just say that reconciliation, you shouldn't give up as soon. You should spend more time with it. You've got more resources for a Christian. So in some ways it's easier than with a non-Christian because with a non-Christian, you don't have as many resources. You don't have as good arguments, but I would say the, here's the problem with the Christian who's wronged you versus the non-Christian, the non-Christian, you say, well, you know, I, I don't know whether they know any better. I mean, you know the place where Treebeard in Lord of the Rings says, a wizard should know better? <laughs> right. You know, he says, he says you're, wait a minute, you've done all this to the trees. And wait a minute, you, you're a wizard. You're not just somebody else. You're not just somebody else. You're a wizard. You should know better. And I do think that Christians very often find it very difficult to forgive other Christians for that very reason. You say, come on. Yeah. So it's easier and harder. So they, they're just different. You know, one of the uh, arguments I've heard back when I worked in the business world, this was really interesting. I, I knew a number of secular business people, and they would say to me, you know, most of the Christian business people I've worked with, they wrong me. They cost me money. They didn't pay me back or something like that. And so that's why I don't pursue God. And I start smiling at them, and I can remember doing this several times. And that irritated them, and they'd look at me, and I'd say, well, it's kind of foolish to keep eternal life from you because somebody didn't live it well, mm. you know? So using the argument that somebody didn't live their Christian faith properly in your eyes is no argument not to pursue a relationship no, with God. No, and, you know, what I always try to, I mean, again, this, this may not be the best bedside manner, but I said, ah, when somebody says, well, this happened, that happened, that's why I, I find Christianity, I said, so that convinced you that Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. <laughs> right, exactly. You know, he said, yeah. I said, now, wait a minute, it's a non sequitur. Just, okay, so this, this 
ostensibly Christian businessman, you know, cheated you. So that means you said, ah, that just proves that Jesus wasn't raised in the dead. I said, you really ought to go look at the evidence <laughs> right. for the Christian faith instead of just say, yeah. you know, that guy you know, was, was, a, was a hypocrite. Right. So it, it So I, much wiser. I kind of understand <laughs> it. I mean, there's no doubt. We, we do believe that if you're an attractive person, you attract people to Christ. But sometimes I think people are not very logical when they, when they just say, oh, look at that person. They say he's a Christian. That shows there's nothing to it. Well, yeah. You know, I mean, they're quack, med- they're quack doctors. That doesn't mean medicine is, yeah. is, is a bogus thing. Dr. Keller, somebody has been listening along, and they might have been influenced by something you've said, but they just can't get to that point of forgiving somebody who has really wounded them. They're still stuck. Yeah. yeah. Then you get, get a conversation partner. I'm not saying it doesn't have to be a necessarily a professional counselor. Get a conversation partner who you think, first of all, maybe has had to forgive. You find, find somebody that you know ha- seems to have forgiven something that would hurt them. Uh, find a conversation partner who's a mature Christian and open up. And I, I just think, uh, I think you probably ought to be talking with somebody about it rather than just, uh, hmm. ju- I, I really do. Now, I'm hoping the book might be of help. Sure, uh, sure. And even though, you know, Jim Daly is quite an, you know, he really can interrogate you. <laughs> I want you to know, however, he didn't get me to say everything that's in the book. Yeah. Uh, Tim, the last question here, because uh, it's such a good illustration. In the book, you mentioned a story about an Australian medical missionary, uh, which was very oh. powerful. So we don't want to miss that one. In India. And there's other stories, but uh, let's hit that one right at the end, because, again, it makes such an impact. Yeah, the, uh, it was an Australian uh, medical missionary family that was uh, quite a number of years ago that was in India working with um, lepers and, and a lot of very, very poor people didn't have good medical treatment. Something that still happens today, I'm afraid, was a, a, an anti-Christian mob um, found the husband and I think two sons and the two sons were with the father in a car and they surrounded the car and, 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 mm. and killed them. Surrounded the car and killed them. And the mother and her daughter, after they've discovered this, said, we're going to stay here and we're going to continue the work. And eventually they, they formed a hospital. Uh, they stayed, she stayed her, in her entire life and uh, daughter grew up there. And they just said, we, you know, this is not going to stop us from loving these people. And of course, today they are venerated by, by the way, by the Hindu um, government, which today is actually still pretty hostile to Christians. Hmm. And yet they got, I forget what the name of them is. There's some highest order of merit that was given to uh, her for, for staying there and doing all this uh, uh, health care for the poor of India. It is pretty remarkable. That is and remarkable. And she, she, when she was being covered, it was, it was big news, of course, at the time. And she says, well, we're going to forgive and we're going to stay. And forgiveness is an act of self-denial. But we live in a culture that continually says self-assertion, self-assertion. Don't let anybody make you feel guilty. Don't let anybody walk all over you. Don't let anybody keep you from what you want. In a culture of self-assertion, we will become more and more incapable of forgiveness. And Christians will more and more be a counterculture in which forgiveness is still possible. And I think, I think Christians, therefore, can be salt and light in this country if we're still able to forgive, but not if we start to use all the same belligerent sort of language that everybody else is using. Kind of ending where we started when I said that we're in the Christian community, we're use, trying to use carnal tools to battle carnal you, people. You did say that. I did. How wise of you. To, and then <laughs> expecting a spiritual result. No, you're right. You totally. got to use spiritual tools to get a spiritual result. Totally right. Yeah. <laughs> Tim, it's so good to be with you. Thank you. I mean, when you say thank you for your time, that can often be a throwaway line. But given what's happening in your life and where God has you right now, Thank you for your time. Well, thank you for actually coming all the way, (laughs) just yards from where I live in order to have a live interview. 
I was amazed. If you're well, gonna, I said, if you're going to do that, okay. Well, that I was kind. Out, so. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. What a privilege to visit with Dr. Tim Keller, who so graciously spoke with us on this important topic of forgiveness. Uh, his book is called Forgive, Why Should I and How Can I? And John, I think every Christian should have a go-to resource like this that they can use in helping to heal relationships that are strained. Dr. Keller has compiled biblical wisdom on the principles and practices of forgiveness and how to reconcile with someone and receiving God's forgiveness in the process. And when you make a donation to Focus on the Family, we'll send you a copy of Tim Keller's book as our way of saying thank you for participating in ministry. Donate today as you can when you call 800, the letter A in the word family, 800-232-6459, or check the link in the program notes. On behalf of Jim Daly and the entire team, thanks for joining us today for Focus on the Family. I'm John Fuller inviting you back as we once again help you and your family thrive in Christ.